we find the Apostle Paul demonstrating a level of transparency that I think is refreshing for the church. Understand that this Apostle has to manage the tension of being great while simultaneously remaining grounded. As an apostle, he's got to operate with confidence without ever allowing himself to become conceited. And one of the constant refrains of the Pauline epistles is he always guides the church against the danger of what he calls boasting or glorying or becoming puffed up. And so saints, this is an interesting text because Paul says, I prayed, I asked God three times for this thing to be removed from me. And God's response is that it's not going to be removed, but I'm gonna give you a grace to be able to bear up under the weight of this adversity. And see, I wanna just say three things, about four things when, about how to handle it when the prayers are not answered the way we like. See, one of the things I've learned the hard way, first thing, is that sometimes God won't remove things that keep you prayerful and close to him. See, Paul prayed that this thing would be removed from him, but it is literally the thorn that agitates his flesh that helps Paul to operate with a sense of dependence. It is that thorn in his flesh that ushers him to his knees. It is the thorn in his flesh that operates as the driving agent that we talked about earlier this day that keeps him closer to the foot of the cross. And see, the thing that oftentimes we do is sometimes when life gets hard, we'll say, God, I want you to get me out of this instead of asking asking God, what do you want me to get out of this? And see, there are some times where we want those pressures and tensions that keep us close to the cross to be removed, but why would God remove those things that keep you close to him? Does that make sense? In other words, there are certain tensions in your life that God deems necessary and essential to the development of your character and the sanctification of your soul. Are you with me tonight, saints? It is, that's why, because like there, there are certain personalities that some of us try to avoid and elude in life. But have you ever noticed that no matter if you try to leave one church to get away from a certain type of person, when you get to the new church, that same person is at your new church. You, you may try to leave one job to get away from a personality, but when you get to that new job, that same personality shows up at your new job. And it doesn't matter how many times you divorce and remarry, those same things you are trying to escape are going to show up in every new circumstance you encounter. And what I'm saying to somebody tonight is that sometimes you don't need a new situation, you don't need a new job, you don't need a new church, what you need is a new heart from Jesus Christ and see there are times where God refuses to remove those things that are gonna keep you close to his side does that make sense tonight church but understand what the thorn is is inconsequential what matters is actually the work of the thorn because understand that the thorn was not fatal but it was frustrating it was not lethal but it was lingering it was not terminal, but it was tormenting. And the thing that you've got to understand about your thorn is that its purpose is not to destroy you. Its design is simply to prick you. Its purpose is to create just a little discomfort so that it'll, it won't kill you, but it'll frustrate you. It won't kill you, but it'll prick you. It won't kill you, but it'll annoy you. And the thing about the thorn is that it's not punitive. What it literally does is it will kick in so that Paul would feel the pain whenever he started feeling himself.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. We are live. Let me get this out of the way. I was monitoring the audio there for a little bit. Good morning once again, and thank you so much for joining us this morning for this presentation. We are not on our usual platform, Google Meet, where we would normally uh, gather and have uh, Sabbath worship together, but um, for the sake of those persons who are unable to join us um, for an afternoon presentation, I have decided to shift things up this morning to give them the opportunity to be able to view the program and not miss it because, you know, 3 p.m. in the afternoon is late evening in the UK, in Africa, in China, and in these all uh, other areas. And so uh, 10 o'clock this morning uh, is a good time to be able to allow as many persons as possible to be able to view the program. Now, I have in store for you this morning a very, very special uh, presentation. Uh, it is titled, um, let's see if we could put a title on there. It is titled Blue Laws Sunday and the Trinity. Now, you may be wondering, is there a connection between Blue Laws Sunday and the Trinity? And um, we're going to find out this morning. Um, and you may be wondering what exactly is Blue Laws. For some of you might be hearing this for the first time. Um, you might not have heard the term before. However, you must have looked, if you're Seven Adventist, you must have learned the term Sunday laws or Sunday lore. And so we'll be looking at that this morning. But first of all, do me a favor and share this link with as many persons as possible. There will be, I, I, I assure you, there's, there's going to be a lot of information that will be beneficial to you, to your loved ones, to as many persons who will hear, and they will appreciate the information therein. Uh, we've, we've, we've packed a good presentation for you this morning and you'll be the judge. So please share this link. We are not live on Facebook. We're only using the platform YouTube for this presentation this morning. Um, but I would like to invite you to share, uh, as, as with as many persons as possible. And yes, if you'd like to record this presentation, feel free to go ahead and record it. Um, we don't even know if they're going to permit this presentation to remain on, on the platform. But uh, if you'd like to record it, go right ahead and record it. And uh, take your notes. Make sure you have your pen and paper taking your notes as well. As uh, I would like for you to verify all the information that I'm presenting to you. I do not want for you to take what I'm saying or what I've presented to you as gospel. I'd like for you to go and to verify the information that has been presented to you and to see whether it is factual or not. Even though I could promise you that it is going to be factual, but I'd like for you to find out on your own. And so I present to you this information, this investigative presentation this morning, and I hope that you will do you, your due diligence and to verify all of the information therein. To begin this morning, we're not going to waste much time. We are going to pray as we invite the presence of the Lord with us uh, throughout this presentation. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this platform to be able to present information that is vital to everyone's salvation. I pray that your spirit will be with us to lead us, to teach us, beat back the forces of the enemy that may come around to distract and to cause your hair, the hearers of this program uh, to miss vital information. I pray that you will be with us throughout the broadcast and that you will lead minds, hearts to your throne, to you, so that they may come to know you as the only true God and they may also come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to save us all. Thank you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. So I'm going to be switching screens at this time. And uh, like I said, if you'd like to record, feel free to go ahead and do uh, your recording and uh, ensure that you have your pen and paper, that you are uh, taking notes. Now, the topic, as I said this morning, is Blue Laws, Sunday, and the Trinity. We're going to be looking at exactly what these things actually have in common, what the connection is between all these three things, Blue Laws, Sunday, 
and the Trinity. Now let's look at a little bit of uh, introduction here. So first of all, the Blue Laws came to America within, in fact, with the colonists, with those persons from Europe who migrated over to the U.S., they brought along with them um, the customs, the traditions, and they brought along with them what is known as Blue Laws. And I'll tell you in just a little bit why they're called Blue Laws. And so they came to America with traditions that were already established where they came from. And obviously, when you migrate, you tend not to lose, you know, the things that you know so well. That's how paganism spread from Babylon all the way down to Egypt, all the way down to Rome and modern day, you know, today. Now, they outlawed everything. When they passed these blue laws, they outlawed everything from hunting on Sunday to selling any type of goods to walking briskly for a, a, a nature walk, maybe, um, you know, spending time in a park. They banned everything. They banned movie, movie going. They banned everything secular that would uh, sort of contravene their blue laws. Now, some of these colonists uh, prohibited dancing, loud laughing, drinking, buying of alcohol, uh, partying, and all of those things. And this, by the way, was instituted by a league called the International Sunday Observance League. That's what they call themselves, the International Sunday Observance League. And they used their um, connections, if you will, to cause lawmakers, so you're talking about senators, you're talking about Congress people, to pass these laws that would be in their best interest and the best interest of what they believe. Now, these blue laws are also known as Sunday laws. Yes, blue laws is just another name for Sunday laws. Now, it was originally applied to laws supposedly enacted by the Puritans. Now, the Puritans, as I said, the colonists, they moved over from Europe to America. And these Puritans, together with the, 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 the Scottish people, and um, they're the ones who really put these laws in place around the 17th century. Now, they regulated moral behavior in terms of how you lived your life, particularly on Sunday especially what people should or shouldn't do um, on what they deemed to be the Sabbath. Sunday, they call Sunday the Sabbath. And there were harsh penalties for offenders. Now, these laws regulated the sale of consumption of alcohol, so there was no sale of alcohol on Sundays. And today, remnants of such laws and customs still exist today in some parts of the United States, um, there are some persons or some, you know, legislators who still enact or enforce such laws. Um, and even though in some parts of the United States these laws are not enforced, the custom is so ingrained in the people that um, liquor stores are closed on Sundays. And they don't sell liquor on Sundays in some parts of the U.S., not all parts of the U.S., in some parts of the U.S. And so these things, these customs still exist today. Uh, if you were raised in St. Lucia in the Caribbean or in some parts of the world, uh, you would realize that uh, it was a huge deal for folks who had left going to church on Sunday in a Catholic church and immediately they would stop at a bar. I mean, that was that was unacceptable and, and people would be punished. And, and so much so that bars would normally allow, and I, I mean, I'm talking from experience, well, not my experience, but what I've observed uh, when I was younger, that bars would have been closed on Sundays uh, when I was growing up. This was a, still a custom in St. Lucia, in at least where I came from. Um, that bars would have been closed on Sundays, in fact, from the entire morning, not until the evening of Sunday would the bars uh, uh, sort of reopen. But what I observed is that there are some persons who love their alcohol so much that 
when service dismisses at around 12 o'clock, they would not go straight home. They would go to a bar, but the bar would be closed. The doors would be closed, but they would be inside of the bar drinking alcohol. Yes. And if you were brought up in St. Lucia, in certain parts of St. Lucia, you'd probably have observed that as well. I don't know about other parts of the world, but in St. Lucia, this was something that they would have practiced. Now, here's a little trivia for you. Why were they called blue laws? Now, we know that they are Sunday laws. Another, This is just another term, another phrase for Sunday laws. But why were they called blue laws? So these laws originally, they were printed on blue paper or bound in books with blue covers. And so because of that, they were called blue laws. So laws found in books with blue covers. Although these laws were clearly based on Christian beliefs, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that they do not violate the First Amendment established clause or establishment clause. Now, a lot of people, you know, created a warfare over the matter and um, challenged these laws. And so it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled, well, you know, does not really um, go against the First Amendment your or Americans' First Amendment rights. Now, mind you, these blue laws were not only passed in America. They were passed in Canada as well. But we'll see that in just a little bit. Let's examine what exactly were these blue laws for a little bit. Now, these laws banned certain businesses, as I told you before. They banned certain businesses and recreational activities on Sundays and imposed restrictions on the retail of hard liquor, goods, consumables. These laws also place limitations on a range of other endeavors, um, including traveling. So you're not allowed to just travel from one place to another. You were supposed to remain confined except to go to service on Sunday, but remain confined to your homes, to your family. Uh, fashion shows and fashions and the shopping of that kind of uh, in that nature was prohibited. Hunting, which was a very common practice during that period, uh, was also prohibited on Sundays. Uh, professional sports were also prohibited on Sundays. Stage performances, theater, these were also prohibited. Movie showings were also prohibited. Gambling was also prohibited. So a range of things were prohibited on Sundays. Now, now you're beginning to understand where this custom of businesses closing on Sundays and all of those things uh, and how this is ingrained in society. Even today, there aren't any particular laws being enforced concerning Sundays today, but the custom is still being practiced today. So, in essence, what we really had was no work on Sundays. No buying and selling on Sundays, no traveling on Sundays, no hunting on Sundays, no sports on Sundays. In fact, no secular activities on Sundays. So where were those blue laws found? They were enforced, obviously, in the United States, most parts of the United States and Canada. Some European countries, particularly in Austria, Germany, Switzerland, and Norway. Now, remember, these areas already had their laws prior to the United States. It is as a result of Puritans, Scottish people, and migrants from these areas who came to the United States, colonized the United States around the 16th, 17th century. They brought with them these laws, and they put them into the law books and enforced them and created a custom in the United States concerning Sunday. Prior to this, there was no custom. And here's an example of an advertisement from Ontario uh, pro, um, showing um, what these blue laws really were all about and some of the things that were prohibited um, on Sundays. And they were enforced in the province of Ontario. Now, these were referred to there as Sunday laws. 
So if anyone were to contravene such a law, what would have been the punishment? Well, in some parts of the United States, it included fines, payment of a certain amount, $25 to $50 or $0.25 cents sometimes to $0.50. Cents. Now, these may seem sound like a little bit of money, but back then, that was a lot of money, you know. It was a lot of money. And so fines of money of up to 200 pounds of tobacco also uh, would have been required to pay um, to escape uh, the penalty of um, breaking those laws. It also included being locked in the public stocks. As you can see in the photo on the right, um, you would be placed in those stocks and you'd be left there in the public for some time as they would deem necessary. Yeah, it would also include jail time. You would also have to spend time in jail if you couldn't pay the fines or you couldn't come up with about 200 pounds of tobacco. Uh, it would also include banishment. You would be asked to leave the city, leave the area and never return. And in some cases, it would also include death. Yes, it would also include death. That would actually be for those persons who are repeat offenders. Um, the penalty would not be the same as what you would have obtained before, but rather penalty would be ultimate death. So where did this idea of blue laws or Sunday laws really come from? Well, the Roman emperor, now you know this emperor very well. You've learned about him many, many times. And so we're not going to spend too much time on him. But the Roman Emperor Constantine, who took over from the reigns of his father in about 305 or 309 AD, thereabout, he promulgated the first known Sunday law regarding uh, no work on Sundays and no secular activities on Sundays. So he, d he passed this into law at around 321 AD. And a, a, an excerpt of the Codex uh, reads, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. And this is the origin of Sunday law, which um, Emperor Constantine, who converted to Christianity and paved the way for a plethora of pagan traditions to mix with Christianity, um, that happened in 321 AD. That was just about four years prior to what he would have um, put together at the Council of Nicaea to bring officially into the church the Trinity Doctrine. We'll see that a little later. So this law had spread far and wide into Europe. So in 321 AD, the custom was so um, ingrained into the lives and livelihood of the people that it had spread far and wide. And so folks over in the north, in Europe, and many People all around continued the tradition of Sunday law, which gave birth to Sab Sabbatarianism. And for those who don't know, Sabbatarianism is a doctrine of those Christians who believe that the Sabbath, usually on Sundays, as it was practiced during that time, should be observed in accordance with the fourth commandment. Now, they changed the commandment from the seventh day to the first day of the week, and they applied the principles of the fourth commandment to the observance of Sunday. And so they referred to themselves as Sabbatarians. And these Sabbatarians uh, enforced what was sacred for the seventh day. They did it for the first day of the week. In its strictest form, however, Sabbatarians or Sabbatarianism, was the creation of the Scottish and English reformers, especially John Knox. The Scottish Presbyterians and the Puritans took their views to America, as I told you before, when they colonized America, where they instituted these blue laws, which we know to be as Sunday laws. 
and they enacted these laws and made it a custom in the United States. Now, these blue laws are still on the books in most parts where these laws were enacted. They continue to remain there on these books. Now, some states, as, as late as 2017, last I checked, and you could verify all what, of, all what I'm telling you. As late as 2017, um, some states have repealed those laws. And so they've done away with some of those laws, but kept some of the other aspects of those laws on the books, even though they're not being enforced. But they did keep some of those on the books. So let's look at the origin of Sunday law. So Rome instituted this Sunday law uh, under Con Emperor Constantine in 380, 321 AD. It was substituted by Christian practices, uh, pagan practices. Um, Christian, what was widely practiced as Christians, which was biblical, which would have been the seventh day of the, of the week, observing it as the holy sabbath day that was replaced by pagan, pagan practices not just observance of the first day of the week but a plethora of pagan practices flooded into the christian church so you're talking about christmas we're talking about easter we're talking about all these pagan holidays that are observed and you'd notice that the catholics actually observe most holidays in fact most of the calendar holidays are actually Catholic holidays, and these have pagan origins, and they go way back to Babylonian times. And yes, as a result of these pagan practices coming into the Christian church, um, it paved the way for Sunday laws. If you'd notice that these Sunday laws, what is really synonymous with these Sunday laws is the fact that you have an enforceable law which was not something that God did, and it was not something that existed among God's people, that you would be punished and put to death as a result of you not following, you know, the Ten Commandments or the Fourth Commandment. This was something that was uh, sort of exclusive to pagans. And if you did not do as the pagans say, you'd be punished. That's the difference between God's true church and Satan's followers. So we know Sunday laws are on the statute books of America and other parts of the world. And many Seventh-day Adventists are waiting for Sunday law to be enforced in fulfillment of the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13, as we've studied before. But what the majority of Seventh-day Adventists don't realize is the, uh, that this Sunday law or this Sunday law bill is attached to another pagan tradition that also was part of the blue laws or also part of the religious laws. And that is the Trinity Doctrine. And so the Trinity aspect, let's examine the Trinity aspect of the blue laws. I would like for you to notice that this league, the League of International Sunday Observance or Sunday Law, they had other plans which were bigger than Sunday Law itself. Besides their intention to restrict movement, restrict activities, secular activities on Sunday to force people to observe Sunday. They also had plans to enforce another pagan tradition which Rome pioneered and established as law, as we'll see in a while. And that was to prosecute those who did not accept the Trinity Doctrine. And the Review and Herald published a lot of information concerning that by A.T. Jones and company. On January 6, 1890, Honorable W.C.P. Breckenridge, 
A member of Congress from Ken, Turkey, introduced in the House of Representatives the following bill, the Breckenridge Bill, as it is so called. It is a bill to prevent persons from being forced to labor on Sunday. But in this bill, in this Breckenridge Bill, had another caveat, and that would have been to force the Trinity upon persons. And in this bill, let's examine the bill, and the bill states, be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives on, of the United States of America in Congress assemble, that it shall be unlawful for any person or corporation or employee or of any person or corporation in the District of Columbia to perform any secular labor or business or to cause the same to be performed by any person in their employment on Sunday except works of necessity or mercy, referring there to health. Nor shall it be lawful for any person or corporation to receive pay for labor or services performed or rendered in violation of this act. But it doesn't end there. Let's look at another aspect of this Breckenridge Bill. In this connection, let me say, gentlemen, that the District of Columbia has just the same kind of a Sunday law as that of Ohio. This law of the District of Columbia was in force when this book was issued, which I hold in my hand, which was April 1st, 1868. And I am told that this law, which I will read, was re-enacted in 1874. Now, this is A.T. Jones speaking. I now quote from the law, section 1 provides, and this is section uh, 1 of the Breckenridge Law, if any person shall deny the Trinity, he shall, for the first offense, be bored through the tongue and fined 20 pounds. And for the second offense, the offender being thereof convicted as aforesaid shall be stigmatized by burning on the forehead with the letter B and fined 40 pounds. And for the offense, and for the third offense, the offender being thereof convict as aforesaid shall suffer death without the benefit of the clergy. Section 10 of the same law has this. No person whatsoever shall do any bodily labor on the Lord's Day, commonly called Sunday. Now, gentlemen, that law has never been repealed. Let's read this section 1 of the Breckenridge Law again. If any person shall deny the Trinity, not deny Sunday... Not deny anything else, but deny the Trinity. He shall, for the first offense, be bored through the tongue. So a hole would be bored through your tongue. And fined 20 pounds. In addition to a hole being bored through your tongue, you shall be fined 20 pounds. And for the second offense, the offender being thereof convicted as aforesaid. So if you were convicted before having a hole bought through your tongue and having paid 20 pounds, if you still deny the Trinity, you'd be stigmatized by burning on the forehead with the letter B and fined 40 pounds in this instance. Now, if you continue to deny the Trinity and you're convicted a third time, you shall suffer death. You shall be put to death on your third conviction. And that would have been without the benefit of the clergy, without the clergy making an appeal for your case. Meaning that you would have been assumed to be burnt in hell. And here is evidence of this law published in this book, American State Papers. And it is bearing, it is the bearing on state, uh, Sunday legislation, sorry. And you could find this in this edition from 1911. American State Papers bearing on Sunday legislation. So you could verify all of what I'm telling you in this book published in 1911. Now, this is Eddie Jones and Company speaking concerning such a bill, which 
was still existing in their time. Now, in 1890, Eddie Jones and company confirmed that these laws were still on the books, on the law books, that is. And this is what they had to say in the Review and Herald, January 21, 1890. Taking this to some lawyers, they told us that the old law we had found was still binding. This is, very, this is a very strict law and provides that the offender shall pay a fine of 200 pounds of tobacco. But that which makes this Sunday law appear so strange is that it is found in direct connection with another statute which provides that anyone who publicly denies the Trinity as commonly held shall for the first offense have his tongue bored through and for the third offense suffer death without the benefit of the clergy. Possibly the reason why the promoters of the present Sunday law ignore the one now on the statute is because it is in the company of another law so barbarous in its makeup, thus showing the nature of the company Sunday laws of the past have always kept. And that is a very barbarous law, mind you. And so, A.T. Jones continues explaining, there is now on the statute books of this district an old Maryland law which has never been repealed, under which a person convicted of denying the Trinity receive the mark B in his forehead. And this statute is of the date October 26th, 1723. This is a very old law. But it is funny that this law is still on the books today. Funny enough. Well, this is not funny. It is a serious matter. Even though it's not being enforced. But it is still there in most parts. So let's look at the origin of the Trinity Law. We looked at the origin of the Sunday Law. Is there any connection with this law before? Was this just the doing of these Puritans who passed the blue laws in the United States coming from Europe? Is it just them who did this on their own? Or was there already a precedence set? Now, let's examine this. Trinity Doctrine was adopted at the Council of Nicaea under Emperor Constantine in AD 325. At that time, there was no law, but it was widely accepted at the end of this council that the Athanasius version of what the Trinity is, or rather the Athanasius uh, doctrine, was what was accepted as biblical. And Emperor Constantine ruled over the matter together with the bishops of Rome. We're not going to go into the depths of this for this presentation. Now, the debate on the Trinity Doctrine continued as those persons who studied with Arius of uh, Antioch um, did not accept the Trinity as put forward by Athanasius and accepted at the Council of Nicaea under the patronage of Emperor Constantine. And so they continued antagonizing with the Athanasians, and that did not really end not until after 8381. Now, it was around 8381 at the Council of Constantinople that the Trinity Doctrine was completely formalized and the nature of the Holy Spirit was defined. Now, that happened, this Council of Constantinople occurred under the leadership of Emperor Theodosius, together who was also with um, Gregory, who was uh, ruling together with Gregory. But it was really Emperor Theodosius who really pushed for the Council of Constantinople. And this is today uh, uh, Istanbul, Turkey. This is where this council met. Uh, Constantinople was, was, was um, in Istanbul, Turkey. And this council met to put an end to the disputes that were ongoing between the Arians and the Athanasians. And Gregory of Nazianzus, who was recently appointed as Archbishop of Constantinople, 
was also to preside over the council to urge the adoption of his view on the Holy Spirit or the nature of the Holy Spirit to formalize the Holy Spirit's nature as being separate and independent of the Father and the Son. Now, mind you, prior to uh, 8381, there was no def definition of the nature of the Holy Spirit. It was not being taught by the apostles. It was not being taught in the Christian churches, in the early Christian churches. And therefore, it was these Roman empires, emperors and the bishop, Gregory, the archbishop of, of Constantinople, who declared that the Holy Spirit is a third separate being. This was not something that the apostles had taught. This was something that a Roman empire, a Roman emperor, an archbishop had declared. And at that time, we were still dealing with pagan Rome. It was not yet papal Rome. It was still pagan Rome. Historian Charles Freeman states, virtually nothing is known of the theological debates of the Council of 381. But Gregory was certainly hoping to get some acceptance of his belief that the spirit was cons consubstantial with the Father, meaning that the persons are of the same being as substance in this context denotes individual quality. Therefore, Gregory of Nazianzus declared that the Holy Spirit was separate and of the same substance as the Father is and that of the Son, Jesus Christ. Whether he dealt with the matter clumsily or whether there was simply no chance of consensus, the Macedonians Bishops who refused to accept the full divinity of the Holy Spirit left the council. They were the ones who created a warfare over the matter. They were the ones who opposed what was being brought at the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. Now, typically, Gregory of Nazianzus has berated the bishops of, for uh, preferring to have a majority rather than simply accepting the divine word of the Trinity as authority. And he was quite upset over the matter. Now this is taken from Heretics, Pagans, and the Dawn of Monotheistic State, a book published in 2008 by a well-known uh, historian, and you find out on page 96. You could verify all of what I'm presenting to you there, as um, you will see that there are facts, and they are backed up by history. However, Gregory uh, soon became ill. And he had to withdraw from the council. So the question was, who now would preside over the council? And according to Freeman, on page 97 and 98 of his book, it was that one Nectarius, an elderly city senator who had been a popular prefect in the city as a result of his pat uh, patronage of the games, but who was still not a baptized Christian. I want you to pay attention to this. Nectarius was not yet a baptized Christian, but he was now selected to preside over a Christian matter. Nectarius appeared to know no theology, and he had to be initiated into the required faith before being baptized, and then consecrated. And this is the one who presided over a matter involving the church and which would uh, set in stone as a theological doctrine of the church, which today is accepted widely by Christians. Not any of those associated with the apostles, not any of those scholars who were taught at the school of Antioch, none of those presided over a Christian matter, presided over a religious matter, but a non-religious person? It is absolutely bizarre that a man who up to that point wasn't even a Christian 
was now appointed to preside over a major church council tasked with determining a major Christian doctrine regarding the nature of God. Now, according to HarperCollins' Encyclopedia of Catholicism on page 568, the teaching of the three Cappadocians who taught of the Trinity doctrine and taught that the Holy Spirit is God just as the Father is and the Son is, made it, made it possible for the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD to affirm the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Now, you're talking about three Cappadocians. Now, these Cappadocians were heavily taught in paganism which up to that point had nowhere been clearly stated, not even in scripture. Nowhere was the divinity, the divine nature of the Holy Spirit ever been um, clearly stated in scripture, not being taught by the apostles, not even by Jesus, up to that point. Now, Trinitarian Baptist Professor Millard Erickson states, what Athanasius did was to extend his teaching to about the word, to the spirit. So that God exists eternally as a triad sharing one identical and indivisible substance. The Cappadocians, and that is the three Cappadocians, Basil, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Gregory of Nyssa, Developed the Trinity, the, the Trinity doctrine. They developed the doctrine of the Spirit, or the, they developed the nature of the Holy Spirit, and thus of the Trinity further. So they built on what Athanasius had already established at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, and they took it further to define the Trinity as we know it today. Now these are the three Cappadocians, which included Gregory of Nazianzus, who pre. Uh, preceded um, Nectarius, keep forgetting the name. He preceded Nectarius as the one who presided over the Council of Constantinople in AD 381. Now the council adopted a statement that translates into English as this in part. We believe, and this is the, 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 the statement that came out at the end of the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. And this is the statement that they came up with in 381 AD. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. Now, the statement also affirmed belief in one holy Catholic, meaning in this context universal, whole or complete, and apostolic church. And this is the statement. Now, I want to share with you that Emperor Theodosius, who himself had not been baptized, but only a year before convening the council, was like Constantine, nearly six decades earlier. He was instrumental in establishing major major. Church doctrine. Now you're talking about somebody who does not have any theological evidence. You're talking about somebody who's not biblical. But this person, this emperor, just as Constantine, established a major theological doctrine that defines God, the nature of God. Now as historian Charles Freeman notes... It is important to remember that Theodosius had no theological background of his own and that he put in place as dogma a formula containing intractable philosophical problems of which he would have been unaware. In effect, the emperor's laws had silenced the debate when it was still unresolved. 
That's what Theodosius did. And how did he do that? It was a decision that had been reached. Theodosius would tolerate no dissenting views. And as a result of the fact that he did not want any dissenting views and any opposition to the decision that had been taken at the Council of Constantinople, he issued his own edict. Now, as an emperor, he, he had the right to do so. And his edict read as follows. We now order that all churches are to be handed over to the bishops who profess Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of a single majesty, of the same glory, of one splendor, who establish no difference by sacrilegious separation, but who affirm the order of the Trinity by recognizing the persons and uniting the Godhead. And this was the law, an edict is the law. This was the law that Theodosius, Emperor Theodosius, had passed, which dealt with any person who had denied the Trinity. And so we see that this blue law that, uh, that applies to the Trinity and has some barbarous punishments in the United States and which was enacted in the 17th century or 16th to 17th century has a beginning. And so these Puritans who came to the United States, they were not the ones who first coined Trinity laws. These laws were enacted first by Emperor Theodosius in 381 AD at the end of the Council of Constantinople. And not only did he pass a first edict or the first law, he passed a second one. And the second one is the one that is barbaric. And so another edict from Theodosius went further in demanding adherence to the now teaching or to the new teaching. Let us believe, the edict says, let us believe the one deity of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit in equal majesty and in a holy trinity. Pay attention to this. We authorize the followers of this law to assume the title of Catholic Christians. But as for the others, since in our judgment they are foolish madmen, we decree that they shall be branded with the ignominious name of heretic and shall not presume to give their conventicles or assemblies the name of churches. In other words, wherever they gathered, they were not allowed to be recognized as a church. Only those who accept the Trinity doctrine were to be recognized as a church. They were rather referred to as cults. They will suffer in the first place the chastisement of the divine condemnation. And the second, the punishment which our authority in accordance with the will of heaven shall decide to inflict. And so this edict from Emperor Theodosius, this second edict did two things. One, it prevented those persons, the Arians, those persons who did not accept the Trinity doctrine, it denied them recognition as a church. And they would not be recognized as a church. The second aspect of this second edict or the second law would have declared them a condemnation, a divine condemnation, which would have been punishable unto death. Thus, we see a teaching forced onto the church that was foreign to Christ, never taught by the apostles, never taught by Christ, and never enforced by God in such a manner. And unknown to other biblical writers was locked into a place, sorry, was locked into place, and the true biblical revelation about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was now permanently locked out and prevented from being taught. Uh, by those persons who believed in the unadulterated word of God. And that is where we see the Trinity law came from. Again, we rec recognize that the pagans who assumed leadership in the religious things or in religious matters were the ones enforcing such laws. Not the apostles, 
not Jesus, not prophets, not the followers of God, but the pagans. The pagans were the ones who were controlling what was being taught at that time. And so they enforced laws to prevent persons from dissenting or to prevent a different view from what was established by the pagans. And those who agreed with the decision of the emperor of Emperor Theodosius were considered now Catholics, meaning universal, uh, being part of the uh, universal church, wherever they would have been. But anyone who disagreed was in accordance with the edicts of the emperor and church authorities. They were now branded as heretic and dealt with accordingly. Now, this is where the term heretic came from. And the application of heretic, this is where it was born. If this was done today in this manner, would you accept it? And so, pagan emperor was the first to enact Trinity laws after formally establishing the Trinity doctrine. The punishment of the blue laws is in keeping with Rome's punishment. You may say these blue laws concerning the Trinity doctrine, boring a hole in your tongue and making you pay 200 pounds, and then the second one would have been um, to now be branded with a, a letter B on your, on, your, on your head with a hot iron, and then to be punished to death. Uh, these, as barbarous as they sound, was not where these Trinity laws originated. They originated in 381 AD and enforced and enacted by Emperor Theodosius, who was the emperor at the time of Rome. And so here's a little bit of extra trivia for you before we come to a close on today's presentation. So the debate over the Trinity Doctrine continued from 381 AD. And so you had Arians and the Macedonians who continued to deny the Trinity Doctrine and didn't accept it. These Arians were now being persecuted. They were declared as heretics. They were condemned and they were put to death. This antagonistic relationship between those who did not accept the Trinity Doctrine and those who have now accepted it as, as, as theological doctrine of the pagan church of Rome led to what we now know in prophecy as the ten kingdoms splitting from Rome. Now, when these ten kingdoms split from Rome, it led to the first fall of Rome in 476 AD, almost a hundred years later, after the Council of Constantinople, Rome fell. Pagan Rome, that is, fell at that time when the Ten Kingdoms split from Rome. That led the way for pagan Rome, for papal Rome, sorry, to now rise after 476 AD and assume leadership of both religious matters and political matters. Now, Rome assumed religious and political matters uh, after the Ten Kingdoms split from it. In fact, it, it started developing it prior to the Ten Kingdoms splitting. But three kingdoms out of the Ten Kingdoms continued to believe the teachings of the Arians. And these three kingdoms were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. By 538 AD, Rome had destroyed all its opposition against the Trinity Doctrine. Not against Sunday law, but against the Trinity doctrine. The last of these three kingdoms were the Ostrogoths. Now, there is no doubt that these three kingdoms held beliefs concerning God and his son, Jesus Christ, which were not Trinitarian by any stretch of the imagination. They openly rejected the Trinity doctrine of Rome, and so they were persecuted. They were banished and they were persecuted. The challenge these kingdoms posed to Rome was not taken lightly by the bishops of Rome who were charged to enforce the edicts which were passed by Emperor Theodosius. It took many wars until Rome was freed from the Aryan opposition posed by these three kingdoms. And uh, by the way, let me just say this. In the Seventh Adventist Church, you are taught about the three kingdoms which were uprooted by Rome. But you, what you were never taught was the reason that they were uprooted. And today you are learning why these three kingdoms were uprooted. And you could go and verify this in the history books and you will see that these three kingdoms out of the ten kingdoms continued to oppose Rome 
while the other seven kingdoms came around, these three kingdoms continued to oppose Rome on the basis or on the premise of the Trinity doctrine. That is why these three kingdoms were uprooted, because they opposed Rome's Trinity doctrine. You will not be taught this in a prophecy class. You will not be taught this by the Seventh-day Adventist Church or by any other church. And so you have to dig into the history books to verify all of what I'm telling you. So in 534, the Vandals, who were under the Aryan influence, were conquered by the Greeks for the purpose of establishing the supremacy of the Catholics and their churches, Catholic churches, Rome's churches, and to, to, to eradicate all the opposition. And by the way, let me just say this, that the Trinity Doctrine, uh, the Roman Catholic Church has persistently stated that the Trinity Doctrine is its pillar. Upon the Trinity Doctrine, it built its church. It has stated so in the, the Catholic Catechism. Now, with two of the three kingdoms utterly destroyed, that is the Vandals and the Herali, the remaining focus or the remaining kingdom was now the focus of Rome and it was hell-bent on destroying the last kingdom that opposed it and was in the way of its supremacy. So prior to their destruction, a decree by Emperor Justinian at the time, he was the emperor, was issued, and in 533 AD, appointing bishop, the bishop of Rome as head over all Christian churches in both the eastern and the western divisions of the Roman Empire, this appointment could have only been enforced only if the last kingdom was completely destroyed. And so uh, this edict by the emperor, Emperor Justinian, dated AD 533, made the Bishop of Rome the head of all churches, but this edict could not go into effect till all of the Aryans or the remaining Aryan kingdom, the Ostrogoths, the last of the three horns, which were plucked out, was completely destroyed, and it now made room for Rome. It now made room for Rome to rule. And this was accomplished and in 538 AD, Rome began to rule the world, both politically and religiously, until about 1798, when um, Pope Pius was taken captive by um, Berthia, um, uh, Napoleon as well. And so the edict would have been of no effect had... Um, they not accomplish destroying the last of the three kingdoms. Now, by conquering the Ostrogoths and driving them out of Rome, the Pope became the de facto ruler of Rome and the established head over all Christian churches in the Roman Empire. Now, remember, you had an emperor before who made the Pope the ruler over all the churches. And so you had the emperor who was in charge of all political matters, but you also had the Pope who was now ruler over the Christian churches. So you now see where the black Pope and white Pope came, came from. So you have two rulers, one who's the emperor who rules over, over the political matters, and you have one ruler who rules over the religious matters. So now do you see where you have a black Pope and a white Pope? So the white Pope is seen as the religious leader and the black Pope is seen as the political leader. Where do you have this existing today? Well, you have the black pope who is the head of the Jesuit order. And then you have the white pope who is the religious leader. Who today is none other than Francis. And the black pope is the Jesuit head. This arrangement still exists today. Yes, it does. So Justinian's achievements profoundly affected the whole future of Europe and his intervention altered the entire status of the bishops of Rome. His victories were gained over people who to a large extent adhered to the teaching of Arius. 
And so there are many scholars and theologians today within the Seventh day Adventist Church who teach that the Arians were wrong and Athanasius was correct. Let me just give you a little trivia again. Arius was taught at the School of Antioch. The School of Antioch was developed by Lucian of Antioch, and um, who was also taught by the last great apostle, Apostle John. And so these people were taught directly from the Apostle John, who was, we know, being taught of the Holy Spirit and Jesus. The Apostle John has a direct connection with Arius, whereas Athanasius, on the other hand, was taught by origin of Alexandria. Alexandria, we know, is the heart of paganism in Rome. An origin of Alexandria taught Athanasius, and Athanasius was a student of origin. And these people taught, uh, these people believe all the pagan traditions. And they were the ones who brought in the Trinity doctrine and meshed it with Christianity. So you have paganism that took over Christian teachings. And so these theologians in the Seventh-day Adventist Church are misguided. They are, I don't know if they're doing it deliberately, so I can't judge, but they are totally misguided and they are fooling and misleading leading a lot of Seventh-day Adventists today by teaching them that the Aryans are wrong and the Athanasians are right. That is totally off and that is totally false. Study history and you will come to that understanding. So it was the victory over the three Aryan kingdoms that established the supremacy of Bishop of Rome as head of the Christian world. And you should know this by now. What gave or what led to the development of papal Rome to oppress God's people in the Dark Ages, what developed the papacy was the Trinity Doctrine. And so in the last days, what is also going to bring back the power of the, the papal church to lead again for another time of persecution is also going to be the Trinity Doctrine. Which doctrine today has brought all Christian churches together and united and has put an end to Protestantism? It is the Trinity Doctrine. As a matter of fact, the same edict which was passed under Emperor Theodosius in 8381 is the same edict which is being enforced today. Unless you accept the Trinity Doctrine today, you will not be recognized as a Christian church. You will not be part of the Christian World Christian uh, World Council of, of Churches, World Christian Council of Churches, the WCC. You're not going to be part of it. You're not going to be recognized by the Catholic Church. You're not going to be recognized by any entity in government today. If you, as a Christian church, if you do not accept the Trinity or teach the Trinity doctrine, that edict goes way back to 381 AD where Emperor Theodosius enacted this law. And so the contest between Arianism and the Orthodox Catholicism was the means of enthroning the papacy back then in 538 AD. And it is still going to be, it is still today, this doctrine that has brought together all the Protestants and has ceased Protestantism today and clasp hand with Rome on the basis of the Trinity doctrine and now is also giving Rome its power and creating the image of the beast. This is what created the image of the beast at that time in 538 AD. This is what empowered the beast in 538 AD, this Trinity doctrine. And today it is also the Trinity doctrine that is empowering the beast and creating the image of the beast in these last days. And we are so asleep not seeing this. So the three Aryan kingdoms did not comprise, compromise they did not compromise to remain in existence. They chose death over accepting a doctrine that distorts their love and adoration for the Father and the Son. They were killed because they did not compromise. They stood up against this Trinity doctrine, this devilish doctrine. So the question is, will you continue to accept the doctrine of the Trinity that destroys the father and son that denies the father and son that destroys the atonement of Jesus Christ for you, for us, for me? Or will you accept the say of the Lord God Almighty? And so I end this presentation today to ask 
that you do your research, study, examine for yourself what I've presented today. Go over it. Write your notes. Look at it. Examine it. Don't listen to what I just said, but do your research. Also, don't listen to pastors who come and tell you any other thing and, and whatnot without doing your own research. What empowers you is your research. The link has been made. The blue laws that existed in the United States associated with Sunday laws had a barbarous law of the Trinity, which came from 381 AD under Emperor Theodosius. The establishment of the Trinity doctrine paved the way for Rome to rule the world from 538 AD to 1798. The, 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 the establishment of the Trinity doctrine paved the way for the Dark Ages to begin. And thousands and thousands, over 50 million Christians were slaughtered as a result of them not accepting the Trinity doctrine. Today, we are on the cusp of this happening again. We are on the cusp of Rome once again persecuting those persons who reject the Trinity doctrine. I have decided to stand with the word of God and reject the Trinity doctrine at all costs. What about you today? Would you like to compromise and lose heaven or to stand with God and to gain heaven? The choice is yours today. May God richly bless you as we continue to study the word of God. This afternoon, I would like to invite you back online as we have an open mic. You may have questions, you may have comments, and I invite you back via our Google platform, Google Meet platform. The link will be posted on the Advent Ministries page on Facebook. If you'd like to, um, if you'd like to join the, the, the discussion this afternoon, you could message me at uh, 1758 716 one nine five five. That number is one seven five eight seven one six one nine five five. Please message me and let me know that you're you are willing to join us this afternoon for an open mic session where you will be allowed to ask questions, make statements, make presentations, if you will on this topic that we just looked at here this morning. So may God richly bless you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for those who are watching. I pray that you will continue to bless them, continue to guide them. May this information enrich them and convict them and allow them to see the bigger picture in this whole controversy. I thank you for those who are watching and those who will watch even after the broadcast has ended. May you continue to be with us on this Sabbath day, we ask in Jesus' most precious name. Again, may God richly bless you and goodbye. Until we meet again, Take care and Godspeed.